Okay, here we are at the top of the hour, and I'd like to welcome you. My name is Carol Golden, and I'm the Executive Director of the NAFA Limited and Extended Care Planning Center, or as we fondly call it, the LECP. Today, Dan Magnus will discuss the importance of being educated about the benefits available to our veterans. Dan will give a benefits overview and indicate how to access those benefits. First, a few housekeeping items. All attendees are on mute in listen-only mode. If you have a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will address questions at time permits at the end of the session. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Dan Magnus. Dan has been in the insurance industry his entire life. Dan's partnership with senior marketing specialists began in the late 1990s. In 2010, Dan had the privilege of chairing their newly formed advisory council and continues to sit as chairman of that board today. After seven, several years of consulting work with senior marketing specialists, Dan joined the brokerage team full-time in 2012 as the National Sales Director, serving over 10,000 agents nationwide. Today, Dan's current position, a Vice President of Sales, gives him a unique line of sight to the customer, the agent, and FMO staff. Dan has been sharing his insights and knowledge since the early 1980s. He now teaches Medicare courses at universities, keynotes at national insurance conferences, and Medicare certification courses for both the National Guardianship Association and for the American Association of Daily Money Managers. Dan is also an expert contributor for the RICP designation program through the American College and is a published author of Talking Medicare, a resource guide for advisors in the Medicare market. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Mangus. Thank you very much, Carol. I appreciate it. I think that all it just says is that I've been to the, the school of hard knocks uh, in, the, in this business, but. You know, this pandemic has certainly changed a tremendous amount about everything that we do in the 38 years I've been in this business. I've never seen a situation like this, but it's, it really exemplifies why all of us do what we do. We're here to help people in situations that they really didn't expect and, and to look for every way possible that we can help them in any situations that we deal with. And a large part of the population right now are our veterans, so I'm very happy that we're gonna get a chance to talk about this because it seems that so many of those benefits get missed uh, and individuals who have access to things and have earned things just aren't able to utilize them. But uh, we're gonna to talk today a little bit about a few topics. One is VA healthcare and the healthcare system of VA. The other is TRICARE for life and what that actually means for your clients that are retired and ways that we can help them with different long-term care issues. Uh, and some things that you might wanna think about because again, very underutilized and, and get missed. I am gonna go through several details. I'm gonna share some email, or excuse me, uh, website addresses and things like that for you, websites. Um, I will uh, make some of those links available for you after this event and also share my email in case you need me for any reason or have any specific questions about uh, issues we may be dealing with. But let's talk a little bit about veterans and actually what that population looks like. There's, uh, as the slide shows, 18 million veterans uh, in the United States. And the median age, by the way, as you can see, is 65. Uh, and that's very, very interesting because that speaks to just how big of a need it is for you uh, as individuals to help people plan for retirement knowing that those individuals are, are there. But one of the significant things uh, is about 9 million 
individuals served uh, during the Vietnam War. And if the age was, average age was, let's say, 22, then they would be between 67 and 81 right now. And so all of the issues that they come to uh, with that become uh, very, very important. And since so many things, as we're going to talk about later, are presumed to be caused because of that service, um, it ties to a lot of the health conditions they may be dealing with. And as your practice continues, you're going to see some, some pretty interesting changes. Right now, the individuals that are over 65 uh, and were Vietnam vets, you're going to see about 98% of those were men that are over 65. That, however, is, of course, changing as time goes on. You're going to see the demographics of that market change very much. Uh, and 10 years from now, about 700,000 that served uh, in the Gulf War are going to be uh, retiring. So it's a continuing thing that you need to be very, very conscious of. One of the things I'd like for you to think about, though, as we go through some of this material is, is of course, the veteran themselves and how they're impacted by that, but also their dependents and spouses. Uh, they may be uh, widowers or widows uh, of an individual that was, uh, uh, is a veteran, and they have access to some of these things and don't even think about it. So we're going to touch on that just a little bit. So let's jump into it. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the VA healthcare system. And it is a healthcare system. The VA is not a, a benefit itself. Uh, as de defined, it is a healthcare system. They access and are eligible for VA benefits or the benefit of utilizing these different healthcare systems. So in order to become eligible, essentially, if they were not dishonorably discharged, they're probably eligible for VA healthcare. Uh, you need to always check. There's uh, everything about veterans is always uh, has exceptions to it. So there is no hard rule. So if somebody says, no, I'm not eligible, you might want to make sure that you double check that and to be sure, because there's always that gray area where individuals may be because of this or this or this. So always be checking into that. But if they enlisted uh, after 1980 uh, or entered active service after 81, they have a requirement now that they had at least 24 months of service in order to be eligible for VA healthcare. They did not have that before then. So if they came out of the military or veterans uh, from before that period, that 24 month rule doesn't apply. But on something here that I really wanna point out that I think is important, because you are gonna run into this, is that uh, if an individual uh, is a former member of the reserves or national guard, they had to have been called to active duty uh, in order to be able to have uh, eligibility for that VA health care. If they only, if they didn't, um, for, and they only had training purposes only, then those individuals aren't eligible. And there can be some confusion around that because they obviously are going to feel like they may be eligible for some of those things. So what does VA health care system do? Uh, they provide a whole array of, of different health care programs. Uh, the four main areas that they look at are treating illnesses and injury, preventing future health problems, improving your ability to function, and enhancing your quality of life. And they're doing a lot of interesting things with that. In fact, June of last year, uh, as part of the VA Missions Act, they launched an urgent care benefit that allows individuals to access urgent care. Uh, in fact, there's a VA facility uh, locator. It's located at www.va.gov slash find dash locations. Again, I will make sure that everybody has access to these different links. So if for some reason you weren't able to pencil that down, don't worry about it. We'll make sure that you have access to it. Our goal, by the way, today is to introduce you to some things, have, have some things that will maybe stir some thought point some things in the right direction and give you some sources that are reliable sources, you know, so that you don't just go out and, and Google things because that can be kind of dangerous as far as the information. Anytime that they're using the community like that, it's managed through the community care network. Uh, and they will use a TPA to manage that network, to so make sure the network's sufficient, the claims are processed properly, uh, and that the quality is where it should be. So they use outside sources to help manage all that. 
but they're looking at a lot of different ways to make sure that people get access to care. Um, so like for instance, to treat uh, pain, they're looking at uh, Tai Chi, yoga, acupuncture, health coaching, massage therapy. There are a lot of different kinds of things like that that really are interesting to help individuals make sure that whatever is gonna help them the most, that they don't have tunnel vision, that they have the ability to give them some of these different types of things for that. I do wanna mention though here that the VA healthcare system is very different from a military hospital. Uh, and that can be very confusing, and you'll see why in just a little bit when I start talking about TRICARE for Life. But a military hospital is usually located on the base or close to a base, and it's normally dealing with the active uh, military personnel, but it is different from the VA system. So the rules and everything around military hospitals are different from a, a VA hospital, and that can be a little bit, a little bit confusing. So having services, and being eligible for them doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to access them. And this is extremely important as you start working with people and define, helping to, to define what kind of benefits they're gonna have or not have. What they use in order to determine eligibility are what's called priority groups. And they have eight priority groups with priority group one, meaning that you're more than likely going to get an appointment quickly, get in the facilities when you need them, get the doctor's appointment, et cetera. All the way down to eight, which means you're kind of the last in line. And if you uh, want the access to those benefits, it may take you much longer, or you may not have access to them at all, because it really depends on the, the abilities of that facility. And if there's anything we've seen through this pandemic, uh, access to care can change really, really quickly. So I'm gonna give you an overview of these eight so you can have a feel for that. Uh, again, I'll give you a link to these, but I think it's important as you listen to these priority groups to kind of think about the, the thought process of, of, the, of uh, the VA as far as what do they think is really important and what do they, you know, who's gonna get first in line. Priority group one is a service-connected disability that's rated 50% or more disabling. Now I'll pause there for just a second because the percentage of disability is incredibly important for individuals to be able to get, move up these priority levels. And you'll see that, but uh, there are things that you can do that uh, can really help uh, to make sure that whatever their health condition is now, that they're in the right priority group because they may have been put in a priority group five years ago or whatever, and that priority group, maybe their hearing has progressed to be worse, or maybe they've developed a health condition and their priority group is totally different. So they need to make sure they keep that updated. The second thing that's in group one is a service-connected disability that makes you unable to work. Uh, it's also called unemployable whenever you're looking through uh, some of the veteran material. Or you receive the Medal of Honor. Uh, one note I do want to make about priority group one is if you have a mental health condition, they're going to move that right up to the top of the list um, as far as a priority group. Priority group two, a service-connected disability rated 30 or 40% disabling. Group three, you're a former POW, received a purple heart, were discharged for disability that was caused by or got worse because of your active duty service or a service-connected disability that they've rated 10 or 20% disabling. Uh, so group four, receiving VA aid and attendance, which is definitely something we're going to be uh, sharing. And as individuals who plan for long-term care issues, if there is anything that I'd love for you to remember from this whole presentation is aid and attendance, uh, how important that is to your practice. Uh, or they receive VA determination for being catastrophically disabled. Group five, you have a non-compensatable service-connected disability and are rated 0% disabling, disabling. It's a weird thing to say, either you're disabled or not, how can you be 0% disabling? Well, you can have a dis disability 
but it's not enough for them to actually be compensating you financially for. You're receiving VA pensions benefits or you're eligible for Medicaid programs. That's group five. Group six, you served in uh, the Republic of Vietnam between January of 62 and May of 75. Or you served in the Persian Gulf between August and November of 1998. Or you served in active duty on Camp Lejeune for at least 30 days between uh, August of 53 and December of 87. You may also, by the way, be in priority group six if you served in the theater of combat operations after November of 98 or were discharged for, from active duty service on or after January of 2003 and were discharged less than five years ago. Priority group seven, your gross household income is below the geographically adjusted income. And here's something extremely important, especially if you work with like Medicare Advantage programs or anything like that, and you agree to pay co-pays. So co-pays start entering into this picture and they definitely are gonna enter in the picture, by the way, if you're out in the community and getting community care. Um, priority group eight, your, house, your gross household income is above VA income limits and you agree to pay co-pays. And then at, inside priority group eight, there's groups A through G, which I won't bore you with terribly, but uh, just suffice it to say that uh, if you really want a nice evening of, of exciting reading, uh, you can just read through A through G of priority group eight inside the veterans benefits and your family will wonder you know what 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 your problem is but anyway uh priority that priority group again can change any of these priority groups can change it's very important to be conscious of that because people's income could change their their disability could change as far as its rating and percentages va rules could change they could say okay well we're changing the rules for group six this is what the new rules are. We're changing the rules for group three and this is what the new rules, they change all the time. It's a moving target. So um, th that's something that I would recommend. There's something called a veteran service officer or VSO. I recommend individuals go to their VSO at least every 12 to 18 months just to sit down with them and say, hey, listen, it's been a while. Uh, are there any new benefits that are, eligible, you know, that are out there? Anything I need to be aware of? and they can help them with some of that, those kind of issues. Uh, that's, that is also a, a key part of involving other individuals that are inside the veteran system because they can look at things on uh, about that person's uh, service history that that person may not even think about being important, that they were important. Later when I talk about Agent Orange and then some of the other rainbow herbicides, think about that because just think about how they may not even have thought about where they serve. I, I literally had a conversation with a fellow that was doing plumbing at my house this week. And he said that uh, he had some serious health conditions, but never even thought about the fact of whether he's eligible or not. But he told me where he served. And I told him, I said, you absolutely are eligible for benefits, potentially eligible for benefits that you need to go talk to them about. So it's, the person doesn't know. So what about other forms of health care? What if you have VA health care, but you also have uh, maybe a Medicare supplement or, or a Medicare Advantage plan or Medicaid or, or TRICARE? Well, this is, this is where uh, you need to be kind of conscious of what's happening uh, as to whether or not you want to use the VA services, can get into the VA services, if they're providing what you want, uh, or you may want to use uh, some of their community care services as well. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that they cannot bill your, um, they can't bill Medicare or Medicaid because that's another governmental program, but they will bill if you have outside uh, insurance. So they're gonna send a bill to those individuals, but they're not gonna try to bill Medicare or, or Medicaid in those situations. But it's regardless of what you have, it's not gonna impact your VA health care benefits because you basically kind of step outside of the rest of the world and start in working with VA whenever you uh, step into a VA facility. Uh, but for priority groups six through eight, just I had mentioned co-pays a minute ago, 
the veterans will pay $15, and this is right now, $15 for primary care visits, $50 for specialty care visits, and if they're inpatient, uh, for the first 90 days, they're $1,364 plus $10 a day per diem charge. Um, and if a person wants to go to the uh, VA to get their medications, which we see quite a bit, because uh, that's a credible coverage under Medicare Part D, they can actually uh, have a Part D plan, and uh, veterans, if they want to, but if they choose not to, there's not a late enrollment penalty for Medicare Part D. But if they do go to the VA to get their medications, uh, they have to be get that prescription from a, a VA physician and then fill it at the VA, and it's $5 for generics, $8 for non-preferred generics, and $11 for name brand. So they can utilize those services. You see a lot of people doing that. Um, sometimes it's best if you're working with the client, if you are trying to determine the best program to get their medicine, you might wanna compare, okay, what does it cost if you go to the VA? What's it cost if you pay cash? What's it cost if you use your Part D plan? You know, what's it cost if you use a discount program? Look at every, you know, look under every rock to make sure you're helping them. So uh, one of the questions that do come up is, does a person have to have be enrolled into Medicare if they have VA healthcare? The answer is they do not have to have Medicare Part B. And uh, they, so that's, if they just stay completely inside the VA healthcare system, they don't have to worry about having Medicare Part B. But if they ever want to have treatment outside of the VA healthcare system, at a local hospital, local physician, or, or whatever, uh, then they are going to have to have Medicare Part B for that. And if they, if they are late enrolling, enrolling in Medicare Part B, they could have a penalty. So generally, um, almost without exception, we recommend people get Medicare Part B as soon as they become eligible and have that as a backup because you never know when things are going to change. You don't know when, uh, like the slide says, if Congress is going to change something and the funding all changes and, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well now you need Medicare Part B and you go to get it and then there'll be a late enrollment penalty that lasts for the rest of your life. So you don't want that to happen. Uh, but it also gives you a lot more flexibility. Uh, it gives you the flexibility of using the VA if you need to. But you may want to go out outside and use some, some other facility or some other specialist or something uh, and uh, want to be able to access that outside. So uh, we usually recommend a person go ahead and get Medicare Part B. So there is, uh, enters into the picture now, TRICARE for Life. And I want to be able to talk a little bit about this, but uh, there is a big difference in uh, the term TRICARE and the term TRICARE for Life. Because TRICARE, picture it like a big group, like the government, like military is the big employer. If that person is working there at the employer, then they have the employee's health insurance. The employee's health insurance for veterans is TRICARE. If they retire, the retiree program for the military is as long as they've had 20 years service to retire is TRICARE for Life. So that's, if they have TRICARE, then they can use uh, a VA hospital. But if they have TRICARE for Life, the VA facilities aren't Medicare authorized providers, so it's literally out of network with them. And they can end up with a, a pretty large bill if they go in for non-service related conditions into a VA facility and have TRICARE for Life. So the game all changes when that person retire. So if somebody has TRICARE for Life, you need to start really seeing whether or not should they go to the VA hospital, should they go to uh, uh, another type of hospital. Uh, those are the decisions you have to make. So let's, let's talk about TRICARE for Life because this is going to be something you're going to see quite a bit. TRICARE for Life, again, is uh, something that is a retirement program. And so because of that, TRICARE for Life is managed by the Department of Defense and Medicare is managed by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And so it becomes a health insurance program that, is, that starts to coordinate with Medicare. So what it does with Medicare is it wraps around Medicare. So if you ever worked with Medicaid programs, 
for instance, uh, Medicare is the base, and then the state Medicaid kind of layers on top of that. The same exact way is with TRICARE for Life. They have Medicare as the base, TRICARE for Life layers on top of that, uh, that uh, benefit. This is extremely relevant because a person can have original Medicare or they might have uh, Medicare Advantage. Either one is still Medicare and then TRICARE for Life wraps around that. This year, almost all of the major insurance carriers dramatically expanded their TRICARE for Life Medicare Advantage programs. Uh, I know companies like Aetna and United Healthcare went, and dramatically expanded their footprint for their uh, program that is built for veterans. But since it is a Medicare Advantage program, uh, it's usually a MA only. They don't normally have a prescription drug benefit on a program like that because of the way that TRICARE for Life works with that. But it is important to know that it is a TRICARE, uh, TRICARE for Life is a wraparound program. So some of the questions that I, I get is, does TRICARE for Life cover long-term care? And as all of you know, because that's the field that you're in, um, there's a difference between being in a skilled nursing facility and getting skilled nursing care and having long-term care, custodial care. Medicare nor TRICARE for Life cover custodial care. However, they do cover skilled nursing facility care. Medicare covers uh, skilled nursing facility by requiring a, a three-day hospital stay. Now, there's some exceptions to that right now because of the pandemic. But then after that, when that person's admitted into a, a facility, as long as they're getting skilled nursing care, then Medicare will cover that for the first 80 days. Uh, or excuse me, first 100 days. Uh, the, uh, after that point, Medicare actually stops. Well, well, TRICARE for Life uses that same requirement of the hospital stay and needing skilled nursing. But here's the difference. If they are in a TRICARE for Life authorized facility, if they're in network, in other words, with that, then they continue to pay for that skilled nursing after that 100 days for an unlimited period of time. So if that person is, is falling eligible for that because of TRICARE for Life, then it steps in and starts paying. Again, very similar to, to Medicaid in that respect, and some of the same kind of rules. And I only share that with you because I know all of you are familiar with those types of programs, uh, but it allows that person to have that skilled nursing uh, as long as they need to. So where Medicare is limited to 100 days, TRICARE for Life continues on uh, after that. The second question I mentioned a minute ago about prescription drugs. Do I need a Part D plan? Uh, if I'm on TRICARE for Life. Uh, again, reminding you that TRICARE for Life is the retiree benefit for somebody who has been in uh, service for over, normally over 20 years and then retires. That doesn't mean that they're just a veteran, that they have TRICARE for Life. They have a very comprehensive drug benefit under TRICARE for Life. It's managed by Express Scripts and they do a very, very good job uh, and so normally you do not want to add a drug plan because it can get messy trying to file your drug claims if you have a drug plan as well. So it's normally not recommended to put a drug plan in place for somebody that has TRICARE for life. Uh, so if you do put a Medicare Advantage plan in, I would recommend an MA only, not an MAPD, uh, if you see that, so that that's a lot cleaner for them. By the way, uh, since most of the TRICARE for Life individuals use mail order, it's very popular, not all of them, but it's very popular. Uh, right now with some of the slow mail service and things like that, you need to make sure they're getting their maintenance drugs ordered ahead of time and, and get those in. Some of the narcotic type drugs, you can't do that with, but any drugs that you can, get them in house so that that person that's concerned or run, run out of those. This TRICARE for Life handbook uh, is the TRICARE for Life Bible, if you will, for you. Uh, if you're going to work with retirees and you're going to run into people with TRICARE for Life, you want to have access to that TRICARE for Life handbook available to you because it can be a tremendous reference, reference tool for you. 
it's updated annually. They just updated it in February. Um, and if you go to that website, over on the right hand of that web, web website, on the bottom, towards the bottom, you'll see that uh, TRICARE for Life handbook there. And you'll also see this TRICARE and Medicare Turning 65 brochure. Both are just wonderful, wonderful tools for you. Now, you may or may not run into claims issues with them, uh, but if you do, uh, you need to know who's gonna pay first. In other words, who, who trumps who when it comes to paying for claims? If it's a normal claim, it's more normally Medicare and then TRICARE for life. If it's not covered by Medicare, uh, and that can happen, like for instance, if they have overseas treatment, TRICARE for life will cover that. Medicare doesn't, I mean, in a very limited fashion, Medicare will, but TRICARE for life uh, is going to be the single one that they file for that if Medicare doesn't cover it. And it's gonna go through WPS. You see that out there, that's the Wisconsin Physician Services. That's who processes those claims. Uh, if you have individual health insurance uh, that's not group, then Medicare is going to pay, then the other health insurance, and then they file with TRICARE for Life. If you have group insurance, the group plan pays, then Medicare, then TRICARE for Life. Um, so if, that's, if that is uh, under over 20 employees, if it's under 20 employees and rules change, it's Medicare, then another health insurance, and then TRICARE for Life. I'm probably boring you with some of that, but this, this publication right here and many others are available on medicare.gov. If you go to medicare.gov, on the right-hand side of that web page, there's a resource tab. You hit that resource tab and go down, there's uh, publications, free publications. That is a, a beautiful place to go to get information about Medicare or any type of publications. Those publications are free and they're compliant, two of my favorite things, but you wanna, you wanna make sure that you uh, utilize that. It's a, it's a great resource. Uh, in order to get TRICARE for Life benefits though, uh, you have to have your system, your uh, information updated in your system, which is the DEERS system, which is the Defense Enrollment Reporting System. Uh, if somebody's had a change uh, in income or uh, or in moving or marital status, things like that, and it's not updated in DEERS, then they're not gonna get their benefits. So you wanna make sure that you help them to do that. If you're, if you're meeting with people that are just going on to Medicare, it's very important for you to, if TRICARE for Life is involved, help them, help them go out to DEERS and update their, their information in the system so they can access those benefits. This is a program, uh, since you work with long-term care, that uh, is unquestionably something that you want to pay attention to. Um, VA aid and attendance, uh, or housebound benefits, provide monthly payments added to their VA pension. Uh, so if they need help with their daily activities or, or housebound, they need to really find out if they qualify. Uh, veterans who think they meet that criteria, uh, should apply even if their income exceeds uh, the threshold for standard pension benefits because they may still qualify for the aid and attendance. I had one um, a few weeks ago that it was uh, $1,600 a month that it made difference for that particular individual for when you added it and the other benefits that we were working on together uh, for that household and they had no idea. Where this is really, really important is for individuals who are widows um, because they may not even think about it. Their spouse may have died 20 years ago and they don't even think about, or the family doesn't, that okay, they're in the nursing home now, maybe their pension could be increased uh, because of the, the benefits. Aid and attendance, they need to do that. This, by the way, doesn't necessarily have to do with TRICARE for Life. This is any veteran. They need to check that out. Uh, because they, uh, you know, maybe their uh, spouse died, they served during World War II or something, and, and now they're 90 and they're going into the nursing home, and, and the last thought on their mind is, you know, the benefits that they might have because of their, their spouse that died. Um, but aid and attendance is a, is a wonderful way to help, and it's very underutilized. Most people don't go in and, and 
uh, utilize that benefit the way they need to utilize it. However, a word of caution, uh, when you do start looking for help with aid and attendance or looking for information, be very, very cautious of where you get that information from. If you go out to Google and start looking for aid attendance, you're gonna see hundreds of websites that try to point you to a feed-based assistance for aid attendance. I'm not saying that they're all bad, don't get me wrong, but there are some that are. Uh, there's some that just absolutely uh, just rip people off for how much they charge just for filling out forms that they could fill out if they just wanted to themselves. And so it's a very um, uh, abused area for people that are veterans. So you want to make sure that, that they go to the right place, get information from the, from the VA properly, and that they apply. And most of the time they can apply and get that assistance themselves. You may have to, by the way, on this or any other veterans program, you may have to apply two or three times in order to get approval. Uh, it's, it's a governmental program, but it can, it's a life changer. Aid and attendance is unquestionably a life changer for you. Uh, the next thing is community care. Uh, again, like I mentioned before, they're allowing them people to get more and more care outside of the VA healthcare system. They have minute clinics that they've set up. They do flu shots. Uh, I know last year they did at Walgreens where any veteran could go in and get a free flu shot uh, and, and it was paid for through the VA. Uh, a lot of times home healthcare services or hospice uh, type services, sometimes emergency, <clears throat> durable medical equipment, a lot of those kind of things may fall into that. But the VA is really wanting to, to help individuals to get care where and when they needed to. And plus it helps them uh, with an overloaded system uh, that they have. Also when, with some of the uh, younger ones, a lot of the things like maternity and things like that they have, don't necessarily have the facilities for it, the VA healthcare and they'll use the uh, community services to do that. But watch your, watch your co-pays and co-insurance amounts. This is a, a good example of why a person needs to kind of look and see what else is out there, what they have available. Here's a few key resources for you. Um, the welcome kit is a misnamed document. It is great for people just going in, but it's great for people that have been in that VA program for 20 years. Uh, because it really does kind of go over all the different things that the person can get with the, uh, with the VA healthcare system. And it may really open your eyes to some of that. It's a great reference guide for that. Uh, there's a link on how to apply. You need to know how to get the forms and what the eligibility is, what the processes are. That will take you right to the correct place to do that. Then the VSOs that I mentioned earlier, Normally their offices are going to be inside of a hospital, but sometimes they're not. I mean, but that's, they use, they house there a lot of times, but that site will actually take you somewhere where you can take a look and see where they are. In other words, you can find one that's close to you. And then the VA service related issues. <clears throat> there are certain health conditions that are more likely to affect veterans depending on where they served. For instance, in the Gulf War, they had a lot of sand and dust and high, you know, a lot of high heat. They had the oil well fires they were exposed to, some of them were exposed to pesticides and things like that. That could affect them there. Another is um, service related issues from uh, being serving in Vietnam. Uh, one of the main ones that you, of course, that you hear about is Agent Orange. Uh, it's one of what they call the rainbow herbicides. Uh, it was called Agent Orange because there was an orange stripe on the barrel, uh, but there's also Agent Blue and Agent Green and Agent Pink and other colors that they use for that. But 19 million gallons of herbicides were dumped on uh, on Vietnam, and unfortunately, individuals have been uh, negatively impacted by that. But the laws that allow veterans to get benefits uh, will use a term called presumptive exposure. And that's where you've seen a lot of the biggest recent changes is that how do they define presumptive exposure? Since 1991, those with boots on the ground uh, in Vietnam are presumed exposed. So if they flew in and, and were 
you know, landed and got out of the plane and they were there for two hours, that's still boots on the ground in Vietnam, uh, or if they served the entire time there. So that's a presumed exposure. Also, brown water uh, veterans, those are who served on the inland waterways in Vietnam. And from 2019, the blue water veterans who were on ships stationed within 12 miles of Vietnam. Remember a minute ago, I mentioned about the VSOs being able to access information that person may not think about. That's kind of an area that I was talking about, that kind of thing. They used to, by the way, have to prove that they had exposed if they were on one of those boats. Now it's presumed that they were exposed. And here's an area that is uh, extremely unique because if they worked on the C-123 planes, uh, maybe they served in Germany and uh, the plane just came through and landed there and went on into Vietnam, or, or maybe they served stateside on the C-123 planes. They're the ones that carried the herbicide. If they worked on those planes, there's presumed exposure. And they're also looking at whether or not, right now they're trying to determine whether or not the, the exposure was for those stationed in Thailand too. So it's always, like I said, a moving target, but here's some of the health conditions that are presumed to be because of that exposure. And think about your clients. How many of them have them? Uh, diabetes type two, prostate cancer, Parkinson's disease, Hodgkin's disease, you know, there's, and there's a, a more, more lengthy list, ischemic heart disease, several things that are tied to that, that those are gonna be financial impacts for those people uh, if, they, if they utilize those uh, benefits. So make sure that uh, as they're dealing with these things that they, um, you know, check into that and see if there's any application for them. Last thing I want to do is touch just a little bit, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but touch a little bit on what the outlook is for 2021. Uh, we've had, since the beginning of this year, we've had over 200 legislative and regulatory changes to Medicare uh, because of the pandemic. But the pandemic is not the only thing that's changing Medicare. Medicare is changing uh, as we go into 2021 for other reasons as well. One of them is because of the, of the compensation increase that Medicare Advantage plans are getting for next year. Uh, the incentive programs that they have to add ancillary benefits and things, the way that they can handle chronic conditions. All of these are kind of pointing to new and, and unique benefits under Medicare Advantage plan that you haven't seen before. Telemedicine, of course, has become a huge topic um, you know, a few years ago, very few Medicare Advantage plans had it. Next year, all of them will. You know, it's, a, it's becoming an embedded benefit now. One of the biggest changes too is end-stage renal disease. Um, that ESRD was the only question, health question, they asked on a Medicare Advantage plan. Uh, it, it is right now. You know, do you have ESRD? Because if you do, you can't go into a Medicare Advantage plan. If you already had one and get it, you can keep it, but you couldn't go into one. That's changing in 2021. They're removing that question off of those applications and people with end-stage renal disease can now go into a Medicare Advantage program. So I'm seeing a lot of questions around that. Uh, there's been huge amounts of, of expansion, county expansion. So there's Medicare Advantage plans where there weren't before. Uh, this has impact on people that might have something called a cost plan. Uh, if there's an expansion into that county and there's now Medicare Advantage plans available, then that cost plan has to exit. So people are having to come off those plans or quote unquote losing those plans. Uh, there's certain parts of the country like Colorado that there's a lot of people that are still in those cost plans. So all of these different things are happening inside of Medicare that are impacting people's uh, medications and uh, coverage and everything else. There's also, by the way, on the PDP side, uh, a new program that's going to allow individuals to get uh, insulin and other medications for no more than $35 a month uh, if they're in those particular programs. And so you've got a lot of ways of helping your clients for this coming year. So if you're working with uh, individuals who are uh, retired uh, or maybe just families of individuals that are, it's very important to start asking, you know, are you a veteran? And if you are, then if you do nothing more than say, hey, well, you need to make sure you go to your VSO, see if there's any benefits that you're eligible for. Or 
maybe they're dealing with a long-term care type issue. Have you checked out what uh, benefits you might be eligible for? We need, we need at least find out. Uh, you don't necessarily have to become an expert in it. Uh, just point them in the right direction or maybe raise that question with them. Uh, and you might find that uh, your value to them as, a, as an advisor just steps up uh, a little bit and you can help those people a little bit more. Because that's what we're all trying to do. We're trying to figure out how can we help them? How can we show as much love for these people as we possibly can and, and do everything that we can to, to help them in these bad situations or, or in complicated situations, even from a financial standpoint. So my email address is on the, on the slide. I am more than happy to help in any way possible. If you have a question or if you have a situation you'd like to bounce off of me, just drop me an email. Uh, and again, I'll make uh, all of the links available. I've got about 40 or 50 really key links uh, that I'll make sure that is available and I'm sure Carol can tell you exactly how you're gonna be able to access some of those. But I appreciate the time today and look forward to uh, working together with you. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, I, I think it's very significant, uh, as you mentioned, not to Google this information, but the fact that you have given us information as to which link for which client situation so that the information is fresh, it's accurate, it's updated. And as you said, um, Google works very differently, but in this case, knowing which and where to go for those particular issues, that's super helpful. Um, there is one quick question. I see we have just about a minute or so, um, but uh, when it comes to the uh, percentage of disability, um, which determines the priority groups, is there a, a set way that that is done or is it um, kind of what your doctor indicates or? Yeah, that's determined by the doctor you see in the VA healthcare system. Uh, oh, okay. But then I, again, I'll mention the hearing part because people, people don't think about that, but people's hearing may decline just because of age and it's gonna be presumed it was because of service. That's a, that's a big area that I see that moved up a lot, but yes, it's through the VA healthcare system. Yeah, which, as you said, is very important to uh, update the information. And uh, I'm not sure that anyone I know that deals in this uh, area with their clients is top of mind to think, uh, well, update the information because the grouping is very significant. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm afraid we are now uh, running rapidly out of time and we'll have to ask anyone who has questions to go straight to Dan. Um, he is a knowledgeable person who is so willing to share the information. So thank you, Dan, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. This session will be available on demand, and if you have already signed up for the LECP blog, good. If you haven't, please sign up to hear more from Dan and from other of the extended and long-term care solution specialists. Thanks everybody, and special thanks to you, Dan. Thank you.